leader is fighting for the sovereignty of his nation. I would think so. he thinks so. Yes, and he could be, he could say that, but he's not acknowledging that the sovereignty of his nation was stolen, but in 2014, when the, with a coup d'état that brought uh, that brought this sec this right sector into power, and they have controlled the country since then. It's it's his, it's thuggery what they've done. The, the Medvedev case is a, a case in point. They just take what they need. They go to a house and they they have a how many people have been killed? Uh, serious people. Uh, journalists killed by the, the these uh, battalions. That's what people don't realize. In other words, you can't speak out. You can't. A person like me would have been on the death list on day th day five. Uh, you don't. You, there's no opposition to Zelensky, so he doesn't have a real sovereignty. It was a stolen sovereignty. Do you think uh, President Zelensky would accept an interview with you today? Actually, from. Since I made Ukraine on Fire a documentary, which perhaps you've seen, mm -hmm. which uh, records the uh, the incidents of 2014 and the and the Maidan uh, demonstrations, and shows you the dishonesty behind it. No, I think that they've been very negative, and they would kill me if if I was in Ukraine. I mean, they don't have any. Uh, th these people are very tough. Th these are as rough as they come, in my opinion. And I've seen rough in my life. I mean, these guys are not playing with fear at all. They, they, they. D these are death squads. No, I don't think. And Zelensky would have nothing to do with it. But of course, it would be dangerous for me. And and they've been very hostile in their in their policies to any any Ukrainians abroad are also threatened. In other words, you could be in Paris, but if if you if you speak out too much, you I think Ukrainians know that they're going to be targeted, and I think that's part of the reason they don't talk. A lot of them, you know, you have to take the anti-Russian line, but I think a lot of them are divided. So you think you would be killed, and Zelensky wouldn't even know about it. So there is. Well, I'd be. I don't think. I don't. If I was killed, certainly abroad. No, they wouldn't kill me abroad. I think they'd figure out. A no, way. no, no, no. If you travel to Ukraine, I mean, I, well, I wouldn't I get in. I wouldn't get in, except through Donbass. I'd come. Through. There are some Americans in Donbass who are reporting on the war there, and I read their reports. Actually, they're pretty interesting because they show you the cruelty of what's going on, but never mentioned in the West. Never. That's what's so strange about this. This, this is the modern world that we're living in, and yet this information is not coming out to the mass of the people. And on the contrary, the United States has closed down all the, all the, proper, all the RT, all the, uh, all the information centers that are possible alternative news getting to the American people. They've seriously made an effort, and the BBC, the English, and France, I was shocked when France uh, closed RT down, because RT is actually pretty good. They, yes, they may, you may it's called, there are distortions, but you know as well as I do, because you hear, you speak, uh, that the RT has done a very brave job of putting correspondents into the field in very dangerous positions, and they've gotten great footage of some of the violence that's going on. Well, given the wall of propaganda in the West, I also see the wall of propaganda in Russia, yes. the wall of propaganda in China, the wall of propaganda in India. What do we do with these walls of propaganda? Yes, I talk let's to, talk about Russia, because you, you would know more about it, but my last experience there, newspapers, there was more interesting, There's put it this way, when I went to Venezuela, the United States was saying, back then that Chavez controlled the press. <laughs> I get to Venezuela and there's nothing but criticism of Chavez in the press. It was owned by the, the oligarchs of Venezuela and who hated him. So it was across the board. That's why Chavez opened the uh, the state television, spent more money on it and advertised his point of view through state television. But this, in Russia, uh, there is, uh, what I saw was criticism. I met with a publisher who got the Nobel Prize of that uh, famous newspaper. And his point of view at that time, when I spoke to him a few years ago, was we're operating. Where there is criticism of him, but you know we, you can't call for the overthrow of the government, nor in Venezuela, nor in the United States, for that matter. If you call for the overthrow of uh, the government of the United States, you're going to be in deep trouble. Well, all right. So to push back on that, it's interesting. It's so interesting because we mentioned Elon Musk, and there's a way that people sound when they speak freely. When I speak to, I have family in Ukraine, I have family in Russia. Yep. When I speak to people in Russia, let's put my family aside. When I speak to people in Russia, I think there's fear. I think they don't, 
Um, sometimes when you call for the overthrow of government, that's important, not because you necessarily believe for the overthrow of the government, but you just need to test, test the power centers and make sure they're uh, responsive to the people. And I feel like there's a mix of fear and apathy uh, that is, has a different texture than it does in the United States. That worries me because I, I would like to see the flourishing of a people in all places. Well, as I said, my impression was that there's far more freedom in the press than was was pictured by the West, and and that means different points of view because the Russians are always arguing with themselves. I've never seen a country that's so contentious. There's more, <laughs> there's more screw, uh, intellectuals in Moscow and yeah. the cities than than you can believe, and and the, you know the Russian people there. They've been fighting government for years, back from the 1870s, it was Tsarist times. They're always plotting against the government. And the intelligentsia is known through history as being contentious and anti-government in many ways. And uh, we see the same thing, educated people turning against Russia. I don't appreciate those people because I think they're very spoiled and they don't understand some of the stuff that's going on in the West. But we have a lot of Russians in, in, in the Europe and America that attack uh, Russia and sometimes don't understand that they are under pressure from the United States and they don't understand the size of the pressure. And it that's why Putin connects with the people because he re he represents the common, more the common man who's, who's saying to you, your interests are threatened. Russia is threatened. We are representing only the interests of Russia. Not We're not an empire. We're not going to expand. We, he, he has no in empire intentions, although the West paints pay, it as empire. Uh, I, I see no evidence of it. Uh, why didn't he do something in all these years? Nothing. He did nothing except defend the country in Georgia and in Chechnya. So the imperialist imperative is coming more from the it's West. Imperialist, it's the imperialist agenda. Going back to, uh, I'm sorry, where we left our discussion off. I mean, I was going to go on with America not only being censored, has closed down now, closed down. And you say it's not, it's not fear. Well, it is fear. I am scared because if you get your Facebook page suspended or your YouTube, your, your Twitter account thrown off, a lot of good people are getting there thrown off. You can't say you can't speak out. It affects your business. It goes back to the 1950s when my my father's world, when you could not express any sympathy for uh, a Soviet Union without endangering your job, without basically being not trusted. You had to be part of the program to get along, to go along. Same thing when UK, the United Kingdom. I mean, for all their talk, this Boris Johnson is an idiot. <laughs> but all their talk about, do you remember their policies with the IRA in Ireland when Ireland was threatening them? They cut off the IRA completely. Jerry Adams, who was a, a wonderful guy, I met him, was not allowed to even be heard in Britain during certain years. In France, uh, all constantly through the Algerian War, the Algerians were not allowed to be heard. The, the Algerian War for Independence the, divided France greatly. You could not even show Paths of Glory, a World War I film uh, in France for, uh, I don't know, 20 years after it came out. Uh, censorship is a way of life when democracies also feel threatened they're much more fragile than they pretend to be a healthy democracy would take all the criticism in the world and shrug it off and say okay that's what's good about our country well i'd like to see that in america it used there are times that it's been like that but it's it's so scary now so it is scary that's that's what i was trying to say it's not unscary to me um in China, I would say to you, yes, it's much scarier to me because there is a, the internet wall that they cut off, and I got into problems in China too because I said something in, in years ago about you have to discover your own history, you have to be honest about Mao, you have to be, you have to go back and and let's make a movie about Mao. That upset them, you know, and show his negatives. So China has been much more sensitive than Russia about criticism, much more. And it's, it is a source of problems. But on the other hand, China has a lot of grievances, a lot of going back to the 19th century and the British imperialism of that era and the American imperialism.